Hi, and welcome back to Good Distinctions. I'm your host, Will Wright, and joining me today is Dr. Greg Bataro. Dr. Greg, welcome. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you. Uh, so I usually start with asking my guests, who are you? Which is a huge question, so take it wherever you like. I guess back to basics, I'm a son of God. I am uh, a married uh, husband to Barbara and, and father of seven kids. Um, we live in Connecticut. And uh, I happen to be a Catholic psychologist. And so, uh, yeah, I've had kind of a, a, an adventurous and, and really beautiful journey of discovering my vocation. I spent three and a half years as a Franciscan friar of the renewal before yeah. I went to get my doctorate and before I, I met my wife. And so that's a part of my story. And now just working to you know, continue in some sense of that vocation and and serving god's people and and really seeing a missionary and ministerial kind of vocation through psychology mm -hmm. and and specifically in an academic intellectual way of combining philosophy and and spirituality with the science of psychology mm -hmm. well that's such an important thing that i i think is missing in the broader culture that it, from my own experience as a high school teacher uh, I teach history and religion, and this sort of debate between faith and reason always comes up. And uh, one of the things that's really fruitful is to help the students understand that they're not in conflict, they actually work together. And so I think the big word that had comes to mind for me when I was first looking at Catholic Psych Institute, which is um, the organization that you created and and, and run, is that idea of integration, right? Seeing the whole of the human person. That's right. But with that, the Catholic Science Institute, um, you, you began that, you do quite a few things. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to focus on today in particular was applied personalism. Because um, that was yeah. really intriguing when I saw that online. And uh, I know there's a certificate as well. We we're talking a bit about that before starting the show. So what is uh, what is applied personalism? And then how can people benefit and what sort of people uh really is this targeted towards sure well yeah to back up i think you know faith and reason is so important and i i like to say it's it's faith reason and science mm. because a lot of times people will conflate reason and science mm. as if we're mm -hmm. talking about two separate or you know as as if that's one thing but there's those are you know they're they're really these three categories and so faith is revealed to us and it's a gift of God's grace. It's like what we believe because of what God reveals to us. Mm. Reason is what we arrive to at through our intellect, which is God given. And it, it's, it's in connection with objective truth. And we can, we can let our intellect be formed in that way towards what is reasonable. Uh, but, but we could also be talking about abstract things. Um, mm. that are not in the natural observable world around us. If we're talking about the natural observable world around us, using reason applied to the observable world, that's what science is. Mm. And so there's, there's a really important place for science as well. And at the end of the day, whether we're talking about faith and reason or faith, reason, and science, there should be no tension or conflict between any of that because all of it is this, is derived of the same truth. All mm -hmm. of it points us towards the same truth. God, who is the transcendental truth, who is goodness and beauty itself. So all of these things should be sort of lining up towards that same unified end. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we, we think about how we know anything, a lot of times people get sort of pigeonholed into one way of knowing. And, and so there's, you know, philosophy that's totally ungrounded from, uh, from faith. And, and then we can also have science, which is ungrounded from philosophy, or we can have spirituality, which is ungrounded from philosophy or science. Mm. And so, you know, and that's where, and even within the Catholic space, we can see that happening, you know, when people have yeah, understandable, sure. diagnosable, natural ailments and disorders and then you know the answer is well you need to pray harder and and it'll go away you know your 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 disorder will will be healed if you pray more well are miracles possible absolutely 
And is it always good to pray for anything? Yes, definitely. But we can't divorce that spirituality from natural sciences and natural reason. So we, we really need to think about how we bring together faith, reason, and science to really understand the body, mind, and spirit of the human person. Yeah. And that's what we're doing at the Catholic Psych Institute. There's really no other way to understand the person and how to help people. So in our model that we're developing with faith, reason, and science, it's to understand how the person is made, how the person is formed, because those are two different things. We're made in God's image, but then we're formed in the family and through yeah. experience and life. It's developmental. How a person is wounded is the third thing that we explore. Where are the distortions? What's the effect of concupiscence in this world and original sin? And then fourth is how a person is healed. And every step of the way needs an, a combination of faith, reason, and science. And so if we get to this final point of like, how are we healed? Really, we're looking at collaborating with God's grace, facilitating God's grace. God is the primary mover and the primary, he's the final end. He's, he's the primary agent of change is what we say. So everything comes back to God. If we're a psychologist or if you're a cardiologist, if you're working on hearts, if you're working on brains or whatever it is. You have to see that God is behind the scenes in everything that we're doing and include that in the effort. When we're talking about the person, especially the overlap of the spiritual life or mental emotional life, it becomes even more important that we're really including God in the perspective. So we have this model and we're teaching people how to apply it in relationship to walking with others, especially with emotional and spiritual burdens. So yeah. our certification program that we developed is really for anybody who bears emotional burdens of others. And that could be licensed therapists and psychologists. That could be teachers. We have priests that have gone through our certification. We have uh, you know, parents that have no other reason than wanting to be better parents for their kids because their kids are going to have emotional burdens and they're bearing them along with them. And they do well to learn how how we're made, how we're wounded, how we're healed. So that's a little bit about what we're doing now. That's sort of, it's been since 2012 is when my private practice started. With, that's when Catholic Psych first launched. Mm -hmm. And then we started training other therapists. Then we developed different ways of helping people, online resources. We have courses that we teach. Uh, and then, you know, we took our internal training and decided to manualize it for anybody outside of Catholic Psych. And that's what the certification program has become. Awesome. And so people can go to the website to view that. Yeah, CatholicPsych.com has all the information. Right. All right, we basically so. have two primary things we do. We, we, we help people through our services, and then we train people to help others through our, mm. through our training. So you can find one of those two pathways if you go to CatholicPsych.com. Excellent. So it's, uh, the certificate is for, like you say, anyone who bears the burdens of others who wants to uh, go deeper into understanding how we function and, and ultimately how we find healing in God. What about those people who are seeking um, counseling or therapy? Is there a, a network of sorts? Because it seems like this is a fairly... Um, I, I haven't seen a lot of people doing what you're doing, which is yeah. why it was so intriguing when I first saw it. I, uh, I our mutual um, friend Simone Rascala, uh, I noticed that you did a few interviews with her, and so oh, yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, but I, I was watching some of those, and I was like, man, this is awesome. Sort of the integration of the whole person. That's, I mean, that's what we're what I'm trying to do with good distinctions in a small way is finding uh, that middle ground, that virtuous middle that sees the integration of the whole person, making those good distinctions to, to help us thrive and flourish and um, seek what is good, true, and beautiful. But with Catholic Psych Institute, it seems like, man, I wish I had something like this in Phoenix, right? Like somewhere that I could go and know um, that I'm going to have someone who's trained in this way. So is there a, a network of people who have gone through this already? that you all certify? 
Yeah, we have certified uh, partner mentors everywhere, and we also have our own internal team. So we we work with people anywhere. We oh, great. have a remote model, and so mm-hmm. you, we don't have offices. You don't have to come to an office to have us help you. We are able to use the technology, and even beyond Zoom, we use an app on the on the phone, and we use a lot of voice uh, voice messaging. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you think about it, it's it's zeroing in on the word, the spoken word, mm-hmm. which is obviously powerful enough to create the universe. And it's in a, in a way, um, we, we are able to zero in on the core of the person through the spoken word and being able to mm-hmm. share through audio what's really driving the heart of the person. And so in some ways, and I'm not saying it's it's bad to do therapy in person or anything like that, but it's a different approach that has its own pluses and minuses. And and one of the great benefits of it is that it does it does cut a lot of the distraction out of the process, which ends up making it really efficient. Hmm. And we zero in. We're trained on how to zero in on what is really important about what a person is going through and help a person take that next good step by utilizing voice and audio. And so since we do that, we could do that anywhere. And and we do it everywhere. We do it all around the world. So we have we have clients that are literally all over the world. Um, so if you're in Phoenix or if you're in Pakistan, uh, it actually doesn't matter. We're working with people at every in every time zone. That's fantastic. Um, excellent. So with, uh, I mean, how did, you first come to realize that there's an opening here that this needs to happen. Uh, Cause I think those of us who aren't in psychology in particular, I, it's, there's an intuitive understanding that what we see in the secular psychological community is often, if not antithetical to Catholicism, at least sort of pushes it away. There, there's really not a whole holistic integration of right. Um, we're going to actually help you in your Catholicism. Um, even yeah. those who are uh, like specifically Catholic therapists are still playing from the the playbook of of Freud and others, uh, and that just seems very incompatible with Catholicism. So, like intuitively, I get that, but what led you to sort of say, "All right, I need to do something here." Yeah, and it, it should be said, like, there's a lot of really good Catholic therapists doing the best they can with taking, like, here's here's secular psychology. This is what the degree is based on. This is what your license is based on. Mm-hmm. And then good Catholics are taking that and saying, like, well, how can we make this more Catholic? Nobody is saying, if we were to start from a Catholic foundation first, mm-hmm. what does a psychology look like that's based on a Catholic anthropology? That just doesn't exist, except for in our certification. That's what we're actually building. Yep. So what I first experienced is, and, and this will make the point very clear, and this was my experience. My parents divorced. I grew up Catholic, nominally Catholic, went to church, but had a really strong family life. Yeah. And, and then my parents got divorced when I was 17. So that's a really long time to build really deep roots in the strength of family. And then that was ripped away from me. And so yeah. it threw me for a real loop. And I found my grounding and my own internal foundation in the church teaching on marriage and family, and especially through John Paul II's teaching in love and responsibility. When I read Love and yeah. Responsibility, I was like, this is the answer to everything I'm in pain about right now. And I want to go teach this, and I want to help people with this, and I want to do marriage therapy based on this. I'm going to go to the school that is using love and responsibility as a marriage therapy. There doesn't exist one. (laughs) So that's when I realized Uh because it's like, wait a minute, there's like Catholics are in education. There's Catholic schools. There's Mm -hmm. even Catholic counseling programs and Catholic, you know, psychology. Where's the program that's teaching love and responsibility, marriage therapy that doesn't exist. And in fact, Mm -hmm. Even more maybe scandalous is that Catholic marriage therapy doesn't exist at all. And in fact, if you really want to get into distinctions and definitions, 
if what we believe about marriage is true marriage, there actually does not exist marriage therapy. Hmm. There's relationship therapy, relationship therapy that can yeah. be quite good, that can be applied to marriages and can be very helpful. But there's no therapy that takes as a premise the sacramental life. And last time I checked, if you're Catholic and married, you better be tapping into that sacrament. Right. Yeah. And so I we mean, have doctor... this implicitous sort of dichotomy between huh. this is what psychology says, this is what therapy is, and then this is what it is to be Catholic. So good Catholics who want help on their path don't actually have a place to go where hmm. their faith is integrated in what they're doing. Yeah, no, that's uh, I hadn't thought about that that way. Um, Dr. Scott Hahn often says uh, marriage doesn't make it easy. Marriage makes it possible. Right? Yeah. That, that life of grace is necessary. Uh, and that is a huge component. But everyone I know who's been to, uh, I'm going to start saying so-called marriage therapy because I think you're right. <laughs> yes. um, but anyone I know who goes to marriage therapy, it's basically couples counseling to learn how to communicate better. Not right. that there's anything wrong with that. Oh, it's great. That's that's like a Band-Aid on top of deeper issues. Well, and if you want to make this even more clear, and this is why like the programs are not actually Catholic, because it's like, well, you have to have validated, empirical, scientifically based evidence, you know, research. Well, OK, the, the most gold standard, widely read, widely taught, every single program, Catholic and non-Catholic, that's teaching anything about marriage is going to teach John Gottman. The Gottman School, Gottman Theory, Gottman Research, all this stuff about John Gottman. It turns out that Gottman is fairly liberal and includes same-sex relationships in his research yeah. and is like, you know, DEI. He has to make sure he includes a good number of same-sex, you know, quote-unquote marriages in his marriage research. And mm -hmm. then we're using that research to say this is what marriages will thrive on and how to help marriages flourish. It's like, how, let's call it what it is. Can we improve relationships with this research? 100%. And he talks about communication, and he talks about the signs of you know, how you know a relationship is going to fail, and he can predict divorce, and all these <laughs> other things. It's just not marriage. Any more right. than Obergefell defined marriage. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to be really careful about that. And then we can say like, all right, well then let's develop something that's marriage, actually marriage therapy. And that's yeah. going to necessarily include the catechism. You know, number 1642 talks about the sacramental grace of marriage, matrimonial grace. And it says that it has the power, supernatural power to help couples forgive one another, to pick up their cross and to follow Christ in their marriage. And, and, and to, you know, to, to develop a deep tenderness and fruitfulness in their intimacy. Mm -hmm. Like those are Catholic principles of marriage. So anyways, that, that's what I discovered. I was like, I, I yeah. wanted to do that because of love and responsibility. You know, I did some deep dive research to find out there is no program doing that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, once I dis discovered my vocation was to marriage, because as a friar, I didn't necessarily need to find a psychology program to go to. But and I was learning yeah. from one of the best, Father Benedict Rochelle, who is a psychologist, mm, uh, right. Franciscan. But then I, I was like, all right, I'm going to get married. Uh, well, I better get a job. Where, <laughs> where, where am I going to school? How am I going to make money? And then, you know, so I went to, you know, probably the best program that is in existence, Institute for Psychological Sciences. But even there, they're still beholden to these secular, uh, you know, principles and criteria and hmm. and so they're still teaching the same old secular psychology that everybody learns everywhere else so that's that's why our certification is trying to take that next step like how can we make hmm. this catholic from the ground up that's very important i'm really glad you're doing that work have you seen any people in the psychological community who have seen your work and been affected by it positively where they say, man, maybe I should reconsider how I'm doing things. Maybe especially those who aren't Catholic. Yeah. I mean, we have therapists going, you mean, you mean therapists or yeah, you mean, yeah. what do you mean by people community? that are practicing like the, the therapy community? Yeah. Yeah. So we do, we have therapists going through our certification program and, you know, for the most part, it's just like a lot of really good positive feedback because this mm. is what everybody wanted, 
you know, a lot of people wanted this anyway, and a lot of people didn't even have Divine Mercy or Institute of Psychological Sciences or Steubenville's Masters of Counseling or any of these other good programs that are out there. And so, you know, they just took what they could get and did the best what they could do. And, and they love to be able to integrate their faith more deeply in their work. And so, you know, we're doing, there, there's other programs out there that are trying to do things in little pockets. Um, mm-hmm. There's a group doing some really good work with um, what's called internal family systems, mm-hmm. which is a theoretical orientation. And, and so there's some people doing some good work with like, how can we make that more Catholic? Um, and, and, you know, some various other programs out there, but the, you know, we're, we're kind of just getting started. We just graduated our first pilot students in our certification. So probably more things are going to be, uh, up and coming, but and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I feel like it's only going to go up. I mean, it, it's so needed. It's so important. And having that philosophical grounding in Catholicism, like you say, it's not anywhere else. It is very attractive, even to people who can't uh, articulate it properly. I mean, I, I've i had um, a couple of my students talk about this, uh, like I was saying, this idea of faith and reason. They're opposed to one another. But in their own lives, they know that there's something deeper. There's something more than what the world is offering them. Right. And on the same token, they know there's something more than what their parents are sometimes giving them of saying, well, this is what we do. You know, we go to church. It's what we do without giving any reasons for the faith or any um, further sort of explanations. And so they have this ungrounded faith, ungrounded reason. Uh, and then I, I, I like that you add science because a lot of them are not necessarily all the way scientific, but kind of leaning in that direction. Uh, and so kind of seeing that integration, it, it's something that even if you don't understand it's happening to you, once it clicks, you start living differently. Um, yeah, exactly. Which is phenomenal. So, I, I mean, it has to be something that's attractive to people on a, a very visceral level. Well, and if you if you look at it like that, I think the first thing that was really popular, rightly so, is theology of the body. Mm-hmm. And if you look at John Paul II's teaching there in Theology of the Body, it's like that resonates with you when you're learning it. It's like he knows me. Yeah. And he knows my desires. Mm-hmm. And he knows my my wounds. And when you start to read John Paul II at that level and then you it's aspirational where you're like, I want to I want to form into the man or the woman that he's describing. Mm-hmm. But the thing is people get sort of, they stop at theology of the body. It's like, he didn't just know your sexual desires. Like, in fact, in John Paul II's, like, actual body of writing, sure, he talks about it, but, like, that's not the limit. It's not like he was, like, all obsessed about sexual desire. Like, that was part of the human experience, but he wasn't Mm -hmm. only an expert in that. He was an expert in the human. Right. Right. So we start with John Paul II. People don't realize he and I, you know, I want to put out a lot. I, I'm thinking about a book. I don't know how to title it, but something about the psychology of St. John Paul II, like St. John mm. Paul II, the psychologist. We have to think about JP II as a psychologist because he was more important than Freud, more important than Carl Rogers or Carl Jung or any of the other psychologists from the 20th century. and he was. He was as prolific and he was actually as academic where he he gave us a blueprint of the whole human person actually fleshing out what it is, all these different parts of the person. Like what's the subconscious? What does memory mean? What's the interaction between the body and the spirit? What do the emotions do? How does how does uh, our history affect our emotions, affect our current thinking? cognitive psychology, affective psychology, like all of these things he wrote about. Mm -hmm. And then what does community actually mean for the person? And how are we supposed to exist together? And how does that make us better as individuals? So like he gave answers to all of these problems. And if we can actually break him open and study him in that way, we will find the answers that we are looking for as humans of the 21st century who are in a lot of trouble. 
So that's that's part of what I think we need to be doing. And in terms of this mm. integrated psychology, it's to promote a Catholic standard of mental health, a Catholic proposal of who the human person is mm. that the whole world is dying for. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's like, you know, when, when research comes out that says, okay, uh, puberty blockers are good for children with, you know, gender ideology or gender identity issues. It's like, no, they're not. Yeah. Like, okay, show the research that says that. Yeah. I don't need to show the research that says that because we have faith, which tells us who the person is. We have reason, which validates it. And then it's like, if your science contradicts that, your science is wrong. I don't care what your science is. And then lo and behold, turns out research is terrible. The research design is horrible. And then if we look for better research, we find good research design with results that actually validate and back up the things we already knew to be true based on faith and reason. Mm -hmm. And that's integration. And we can propose that model to the world and actually cut out all the scientism that you said, where it's like, oh, it's, if it's not scientific, we don't know what it really is. It's like, no, we yeah. know. Yeah, first principles are definitely lacking. Uh, one of my best friends is a, um, a pediatrician, and he went to UNC med school, which is pretty decent med school. And he uh, said, uh, yeah, we didn't take any philosophy classes. Your whole four years, no philosophy classes at all. What about the Hippocratic Oath? Did you at least talk about it? And he said, oh, yeah, but it's not the old one. It's been modified. Right. It's like, oh, okay. So it means nothing is, is basically what you're saying. Right. Um, I, that shocked me that our, our MDs are not getting philosophy, just oh, yeah. basic philosophy. It's like, should I do this or not? Like the basic questions we should ask anytime we have new technology or new uh, procedures is, hmm, I can do this, but ought I, ought I do this? <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally gone. Totally gone. Yeah. And now, actually, they're, you're not even learning good medicine anymore because you're getting, I mean, this huge scandal just erupted with all the, a bunch of Ivy League med schools. They're taking classes on the, 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 the value of decolonization in world cultures. All right. So, like, literally overthrow the current social order because we need to let the indigenous people have their land back. That's what mm. med students in Ivy League schools are learning instead of how to operate on your heart. That's scary. It is, it is very scary. Um, I mean, I, was talk I talked to the uh, uh, bioethicist a couple um, episodes ago, and um, we were talking about just one other example is, is women being, uh, girls being prescribed hormonal birth control for a regular period, something like this. It's like, you're not solving any issues. You're masking symptoms, but you're not actually getting to the root of the problem. And that, I mean, and that extrapolates out at almost every level of um, scientific inquiry today. Right. Which is a huge problem. Right, exactly. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to, to see this sort of integrated. Oh, sure. So, I mean, John Paul II, so he would classify himself, I think, as a Thomistic personalist, right? So what is, in your understanding of it, what what is personalism like if you had to describe it to someone sure i mean essentially it's a great integration of different two different philosophies thomism as a foundation and then an a way to talk about the human experience that's more contemporary which mm. comes from a philosophical system called phenomenology and so the you know 20th century brought about a new way of thinking for better or for worse people got more deeply into the psychological inner experience of being human being a self being mm -hmm. the i in the midst of the experience and in the language that was developed there is not necessarily the language that say thomas aquinas would have been writing in because it wasn't the culture right and so you have the 20th century developing people's understanding of self and the psychologist and the philosophy that was emerging from that time is all based on that so what John Paul II did was say, okay, great, like, let's move with the culture into the 20th century, but let's not forget our roots and let it become untethered from this foundation. Mm -hmm. So he, he started from that Thomistic metaphysical, ontological grounding in realism, as it's described, and then 
let it be expressed more deeply and and sort of asked different kinds of questions that the the man and woman of the 20th century was asking and gave them yeah. answers so so that's where personalism sort of emerged it's kind of like the baby uh, of the marriage of of Thomism and phenomenology at yeah. least in in the way that John Paul II presents it and so that's why we use it as a grounding and a foundation because it's thoroughly catholic it's it's based on the traditional philosophical catholic system uh but it also is applicable to real accompaniment walking mm -hmm. with people in the world and in the church today which is the that's the applied part of our certification we we we've developed the model of applied personalism which means we're not just sitting around in a classroom navel gazing talking about ideas it's like well how does this affect the work i do helping somebody who's suffering mm -hmm. And so we're always applying the first principles in, in very real ways. And then if there's some scientific research that does help us understand that person's experience better, great, we're going to use it. If there's some other principle that's going to help us from a different angle, great, we're going to use that. If there's something that we can think about that maybe has nothing to do with helping this person right now, like you could have a personalist approach to architecture. That's not necessarily entering into me working on family systems, dealing with somebody with grief or, or suicidal, you know, uh, grief or, or processing of wounds or traumas, things like that. I'm mm -hmm. sure it's beautiful and it's worth, it's got its own value, <laughs> but that's not in our program because we're talking about applied personalism. Perfect. Well, and that, that's just sticking to first principles, letting first things be first and second things be second. So that's also really admirable. I I'm thrilled that Catholic Psych Institute exists. I'm really glad that you're doing this work. I'm not in psychology, but I'm glad that there are people who are making sure that we are all as healthy as we can be and as whole as we can be. Um, well, thank you very any, much. I, I appreciate that. Absolutely. And anything, uh, anything you'd like to point people to at catholicpsych.com is the website. Yeah, CatholicPsych.com. We we have this kind of novel way of helping people. Uh, it's it's sort of the fruition of our our principles. You know, really took a step back and said, you know, what if there wasn't a once a week forty five minute session given to us as like the only way to help people? What else would this look like if it was really based on Catholic principles? So that's how we developed what we call mentorship for mm -hmm. short. It actually, the full name is Integrated Daily Dialogic Mentorship, IDDM. Yeah. It could throw people off who are looking for help because most people are like, all right, I need help. I need a therapist. I know what to expect. I've seen the TV shows. I've seen it in the movies. <laughs> and then you see our model and you're like, what is this? So I just encourage people to give it a chance. You know, we have some, we have a video on there. I talk about it. We have, you know, free consultations. We talk people through the whole process. And it turns out that it's actually more efficient in helping people get to the deeper problems faster and even be able to work through them faster than what could otherwise be the case in, in the traditional model. Excellent. Well, and I don't want to be overly cynical, but I do want to point out that it seems like you care less about the money and more about helping people. So that's good. That, <laughs> um <laughs> No, and because you know, so I many do, people they're I, incentivized. I mean, therapists are incentivized to drag it out as long as possible in some way. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, like I said, I know there are a lot of really good Catholic therapists out there that are not, you know, financially incentivized, and they are working to really help people, and vocationally so, like as a as a path called by God to do so. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just takes a different chip set to mm -hmm. also just be you know outside the box completely you know and that's you know that's that that's, that's i've great. certainly made mistakes because of that and i've sort of gotten into trouble in my own life because of that too at times so gro growing up was quite an adventure but i think god is doing something with all of that and you know f to to be able to have something as, you know that's creative and outside the box right now and our culture is is becoming uh you know more and more clear that it's it's really necessary at this point. Absolutely, I, Christendom is is over. I mean, we're, we we no longer live in Catholic nations. Uh, we live in pagan societies, more or less, and uh, so we need to think outside of the box. Because, God forbid, we're 
right in the midst of it. Um, yeah. I, I'd prefer to be working outside of that, working with the culture, of course, and evangelizing the culture and the people in it. Um, but it, it's just, it is phenomenal. Um, sort of the approach that you're using. And I, I recommend to everyone, uh, go check out catholicpsych.com. You're on, uh, I know you're on Instagram as well. Uh, you have a YouTube account? Uh, we have we, we have a basic YouTube account. We haven't really done much to, to get stuff going in there. Um, okay. We have a couple of shows and we're developing a new show right now, but you can check out the Being Human podcast. Great. Um, I've got a, I've been consistent with that. We have almost 200 episodes of the being human podcast. And that is another place that I unpack a lot of these ideas. And, um, uh, and you know, if you start following that, subscribe to that. And then we have a new show right now that we're developing. That's exciting too. So I'll be announcing more about that later. Great. Well, everyone listening, go check it out. Being human podcast, Catholic psych.com. Lots of great stuff to see. And, uh, Dr. Greg, thank you so much for coming on and taking the time. I appreciated the conversation and thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you so much, Will. God bless you. Thank you as well. And for those listening, please do go to gooddistinctions.com. Become a free or paid subscriber. I'd really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next week. God bless.